this one, I think, uh, that's kind of the Yeah, perfect. Oh, this thing is not working. All right, um, so my talk, it's on fee rates and the one privacy. Um, my name is Randy. I'm a software engineer at Blockstream. Uh, I typically work on applications for Liquid, but today I'll be talking about Bitcoin and how you might reduce your wallet privacy by using the default fee rates of your wallet. Before I get started, I want to go over some context about these fee rates. So, a couple questions. What are transaction fees? Uh, size versus virtual size, and why are fees important? So, what are transaction fees? Transaction fees, uh, they're the difference between a Bitcoin's transaction's inputs and outputs, um, if you didn't know that. And the fee is pretty much equal to the total input amount minus the total output amount. Um, yeah, I know it shows up kind of small, and that might be a problem for later slides. I hope it's still okay right now. Fees, they're implicit in a Bitcoin transaction and can be set to any arbitrary amount, assuming you have the funds to pay for it. Of course, um, <laughs> fees are typically set to an amount proportional to the size of the transaction it's contained within. So, um, you know, if you have a big transaction, you typically pay more fees, and a transaction being big means like uh, the size of the transaction. And um, Bitcoin transaction fees make a transaction more attractive for miners. It can get your transaction mined and therefore confirmed quicker. So um, again, some more context um, for people who may not be familiar with fees. They're actually paid out in a Coinbase transaction. Uh, I know it's very hard to see, <laughs> but I added a lot of these code snippets. If you're interested in any of these, you can scan the store code and it links you to the code. This happens to be in the Bitcoin core. Um, so let's go. So size versus virtual size. Um, during the SegWit software, a decision was made to modify the size of the transaction to discount the witness when computing your fee rates. Um, because the size used for fees does not represent the true number of bytes in the transaction, it's actually called the virtual size, um, which is why you might see x sats per v byte instead of x sats per byte. Uh, I had some reasoning behind this. Um, <laughs> one is by like Christian Becker, he had something here, and, um, but you know you can't really see them. <laughs> but it's pretty much some justification of why they wanted to discount the witnesses uh, when computing the fees. And um, yeah, I could read a little bit of it here for Christian Becker's response. Um, witnesses do not need to be stored once they have been verified and can be discarded. This effectively reduces the size of the UTXO. The discount is supposed to account for the reduced storage requirements and to encourage users to switch to SegWit, benefiting the network as a whole. So um, that is a little brief side note about fee size. So what I'm actually going to get into today is wallet fingerprinting. If you you know into web dev and things like that, there's a server fingerprinting, which is like figuring out what server software a specific web server is using. And uh, here I'm, the concept is very similar. It's trying to figure out what wallet implementation a user is using uh, based off their transactions, so hence wallet fingerprinting. I actually had some inspiration for this. Um, if you guys know Andrew Chow, he had a, a talk, I guess, at a Bitcoin hackathon that I went to. It's the previous Bitcoin plus plus. And um, he kind of, it's, this is the QR code for that link to the YouTube video. And he also has a repo on GitHub. Basically, so this all served as my inspiration. He did it on different metrics about how you can identify a wallet software implementation. Um, so he had like whether it uses anti-feast uh, sniping with and lock time, um, you know, and all these other things, pretty much. And he did between Bitcoin Core and Electrum. So I like that idea a lot, and I wanted to expand on that. So the wallets that I'm deciding to use are the blue wallet, the green wallet, and the Wasabi wallet. And the question that I have to answer before I can see whether I can identify someone's wallet uh, depending on the transactions is can walls vary in the default fee amount? And the answer is yes, right? So for the same transaction, you could have uh, varying transaction fee amounts depending on the wallet that you're using. So why are the fee rates different? Naively, you might assume, well, they're using different fee sources, and they do. Blue uses Electrum, green uses the green server. Wasabi uses blockchain by default. They actually you know, call out uh, the blockchain API. But that's not the main reason <laughs> that these fees are different. They actually do different algorithms. So there's a fee algorithm for blue. 
and um, here I threw out what I wrote here. The Billy Wallet uses a fee algorithm that multiplies the fee rate for each category of fee rate, so fast, medium, and slow, with the fee rate calculated from one block the mempool, and divides it by the fee rate for one block calculated by Electrum. And that's like a lot of jargon. I'm going to show you a code snippet that hopefully you can see a little bit from that. Um, if the fee rate for the transaction to the mempool is extremely low, while the fee rate for um, coming from Electrum is high, Blue basically tries to account for that by discounting the fee rate. Um, and this is a simplification of what happens. <laughs> and this is the actual code snippet. Again, I know this is very, very hard to see. I was expecting this to be a little bit bigger so you can scan this to our code and see how it's actually done. And um, you know, what does it mean to get one block of the mempool? Um, you actually, they have this little algorithm that you might be able to see. <laughs> They're trying to calculate the V size of things in the transaction um, and see if it could fit in like the, the next block, for example. So again, this is, I added this kind of last minute um, because I was like, maybe, maybe people might have questions and this is the QR code. And this is all open source. Uh, I've only done analysis on open source code. So you could go in the blue wallet uh, repo and look at this for yourself. So if you have um, for green, green is a bit different because they use something called the green server. Um, so I, I can't really do much of that. You know? um, I'm not gonna leak what they have. <laughs> But from an open source perspective, you can see that they make a call to the green server. They use a protocol called WAMP. Um, and yeah, there's not much analysis you know, I can do there from an open source perspective because a lot of it is hidden behind the green server source code, which is not open source. And then we can look at Wasabi's few algorithm. So um, Wasabi, you can source them from uh, your Bitcoin core node as well. They are very flexible to the source code. But one of the fee rate providers is the blockchain fee rate provider. And basically what they do is their algorithm samples from blockchain for fee rates, and then it interpolates the values between the sample fee rates for more granularity. Um, I'm just asking uh, people detail that. So, so it's uh, asking blockstream and it's saying, well, give me a fee for a five block target, or what is it asking blockstream exactly? Yeah, so blockstream has um, an endpoint for fee rates, and yeah. it'll give you a whole bunch of different you know, block yeah. of, how does it give you one number, I'm guessing, because the API doesn't let you No, it, it gives uh, like predefined like block confirmation. Yeah, so you can choose a block target, like 10 blocks. What's, right. what's my fee rate to get in the next 10 blocks, yeah? Right, but the, the API they call is general, and it's like a, a, J, it's a JSON that uh, includes a lot of different desired like target blocks. So what Wasabi does is they pick from a few of them. Uh, they don't like use all of it. The, the, the options you have are, are the, the block target as a number. Is that the only one, or is there, is there like a fast, slow, medium, something? Like no, yeah, there's no fast, slow, medium. It's just a number of blocks. Right. And you're saying you're starting to choose multiple different numbers from that list of possibilities. Right. Three blocks, five blocks, ten blocks, yeah. 20 blocks, I see, right. And, and then, then they interpolate, yeah, they, they interpolate between them. They interpolate between those values. What does that yeah. mean exactly? Um, they have like this, yeah, they'll just oh, switch so this first. All those on a graph, and they just say, oh, we want, they, they choose some between those numbers. Oh, right, yeah, they, there's like algorithms for this that you can interpolate between two different numbers. Um, so, if, like, you look at the source code, yeah, um, I, I don't want to like dive into the source code <laughs> exactly, but you could kind of see they do this interpolate PCHIP sorted, right? Um, and, like, you could look at the libraries they're using and everything. Again, do the QR code here. This is specifically for this like method, yes, yeah, Satoshi per byte. They actually do the sampling thing twice, um, but. I just, it's very hard to capture the context <laughs> of what these wallets are doing because they span uh, sometimes multiple methods and I don't want to have too much source code on my slides. So as you see, it's kind of hard to, <laughs> to read through. Um, but, but yeah, they, they, the basics of what Wasabi is doing is they have this interpolation for the fee algorithm. And again, I highly do recommend, or if you want to get any of these links afterwards, as well, you can fly me down and like, you know, I'll be happy with So if, if they're interpolating, for example, they, they, they get numbers of 3, 5, and 10, and they interpolate 7, let's say. Right. Um, but surely the most important thing is what is the user doing? Because like, if all of that is hidden from the user, and the user never even chooses the fee, then you've got an issue with privacy of them choosing one particular thing, maybe. Right. Is the user like choosing a number, or how does it? They do not. There is a default fee rate for like all these wallets. Um, in general, I think it's like a bad UX if a wallet forces you to choose a fee rate. 
just as a regular user, you might be like, you know, what do I choose? Most wallets are nowadays seem, seems to be the most common thing is they're giving you options in words, low, uh, fast, medium, slow. That's the most common thing I'm seeing. Yeah, um, and for, for example, going back to blue, uh, they do have fast, medium, slow, but like, the default is fast. Right. You know, and it's like, it's good enough for people to want to use. Wasabi, same thing, they have a default fee rate. If you'd like to switch it, they actually have a, like, a chart that pops up, and you can move the slider to say the desired like time that you'd like your uh, transaction to get in by and into the blockchain. So um, yeah, that's the, that's the experience of Wasabi. Um, so I did some like experiments. You know, I was curious um, to see if I could identify anything within how my walls actually make their transactions. And there's a little visualization I made. <laughs> this is for a block, the distribution of the fees, uh, a few rates. So this is one trans uh, test transaction. And, you know, um, this transaction I paid about 14.5 sats per bbyte. And I wanted to see if you could, just off one transaction in a given period of time, for each of these walls reporting the default fee rate, which one it might be. And, um, yeah, so. Blue was reporting 14 sats per bbyte. Green is 14.19, and Wasabi is 29 sats per bbyte. Uh, what actually ended up happening was this became 4.5 sats per bbyte, and this came from green. So um, th there is, you know, a uh, slight discrepancy within these few rates, and I'm thinking maybe I, I might have like sampled it wrong, where green was doing something extra. And I will show that some of the uh, fees that are provided was specifically for a blue wallet they're higher than they need to be um, because of a uh, shortcut they took and the calculation of uh, transactions in the size. This is another test transaction. This is a little bit clearer. Um, you have one fee rate of 12 sats per bbyte for blue. You have another one that's 14.2 for green and then 15 for wasabi. So a little bit more spread out. And the fee rate for this actual transaction that was made is 12.3. and it, if you can see these fee rates, blue had a 12 sats per bbyte, and this actually did come from blue. Why is this 0.3 there? Uh, there's a reason for that, and you know I'll go into that in these uh, next slides. So I want to talk about any other fee-related wallet tells. And going back to what I said, there is a wallet tell from blue, and this shortcut that they take for their calculation. And um, this is the shortcut that they take, pretty much. When you calculate a uh, transaction size, you look at the, the amount of bytes it takes for like a, an input, right? And when you spend from a, um, like a, wit a regular kind of transaction made with a witness, uh, it uses this thing, the transaction input pubkey hash, and they have a constant that's set for it. And why is that bad? Because uh, th there is some variance that can happen in when you create an input uh, for like with a witness for a regular like pay to witness public key hash, and that is your signature can change. Um, you're, there's something, there's some factors on how long your signature is. Uh, there's these like two values like R and S, and you could have a high S value or a high like R value. And if you have both of them high, then uh, that is like kind of bad because you add two extra bytes that you don't need. Bitcoin Core kind of standardizes it, and they try and use like low S and low R, but some wallets like don't really care. Blue is one of them; they don't enforce like you know low S and low R. Um, in the source code, it's easy enough like if they wanted to enable it, but for R, it's a little harder. You have to do something called low R grinding, which is like this uh, you know it's a little bit more computationally expensive. So um, Blue, they just assume that you will be using like high R and high S, and they have like another extra byte in the calculation. So sometimes when you insert an input for your transaction, uh, Blue pretty much overestimates an extra three bytes. You might be paying um, for an extra three bytes that like, you didn't actually use. And I guess that's one of the tells from Blue Wallet. As far as I can tell, these other wallets, they don't have this problem. They kind of estimate the virtual size a little bit more accurately. So Green, um, Green is a wallet that uses another library called the GDK and GDK this is another library called the Wallet to calculate the virtual size. Uh, so I included a snippet here, and they're a little more accurate. They'll kind of make those shortcuts. And same thing for Wasabi. Uh, they're also more accurate because they use something called M Bitcoin, which is kind of a pretty sophisticated Bitcoin library for C sharp. 
And um, yeah, so again, here's these code snippets and QR code. So uh, the top's pretty much over. The conclusion is wall fingerprinting can definitely be a threat to your on chain privacy via the analysis of fee rates. But whether that trade off of privacy for convenience is worth it up to you. <laughs> like, that's uh, pretty much what I can say. Because some users may not care about this, but I think at the very least, everyone should be aware that this is a uh, leakage of information. And yeah, so thank you. That's you know, all I have for this talk. Does it make sense to, for example, try to uh, be like Bitcoin Core or be like Electrum, for example? Yeah, um, we were having some discussions where like you could either hide in plain sight, right, where like you could try and share a fee rate with whatever is the most popular being used, or you could have some kind of like variance. You could put some like randomization in it, and that kind of like uh, helps obscure which wallet they can come from. But but yeah, so that's a, a common thing that people try and do. Let's try and standardize and do whatever Bitcoin Core does. So in terms of like hiding the low S in your signature, right? Using uh, like low R grinding for all of your transactions that helps standardize things uh, and make like your fee rates look more uniform, right? And won't well, have your wallet stand out like Bruce Wallet, for example. Uh, yeah. And back, uh, yeah. It's, um, can you have you looked at pairing that along with things like say in lock time and, and sequence to kind of confirm that um, that assumption about certain wallets? Because I looked at this very briefly, but they, team, they seem to be two fields that were also uh, vulnerable to fingerprinting. Yeah, and so... And that with a fee together would like really confirm... You know, yeah, putting all this together, you could definitely create something pretty strong for a lot of fingerprinting. So again, this is back in the intro, but um, Andrew Chow... Uh, oh, <laughs> sorry. But yeah, Andrew Chow had a presentation and he did use things for like the fee and all that. And I recommend watching it. Um, his presentation, he also has some sample code in Rust on how you might be able to do that. So, um, but, but yes, you can provide it with you know, more things. And did someone else have a question? Yeah, yeah. Just, can you go over what bad things could happen if someone else finds out what type of wallet you're using? Like what's yeah, depending on your wallet implementation, uh, maybe there's like... Like a vulnerability that they know yeah, or, or even like a behavior that someone can game, right? Like uh, if, or let's say Blue Rate, uh, or I'm sorry, Blue uses the mempool to help calculate their um, the transaction uh, rates, right? How about if I fill the mempool with a whole bunch of like, I don't know, high value transactions to screw one person over, <laughs> or something similar, right? Uh, so depending on like what each wallet does, I can I can game them, and if I know that using a certain wallet, I can make you pay like more fees just to have malicious active. Um, that's, it. that's true, but also I think the simplest answer to sort of like why this is a problem is just a simple thing, the simplest possible transaction, you're spending some money giving it to someone and you've got change output. Now chain analysis might be able to figure out the change output, but often, often they can't figure out which is the change of the payment. But if, if it's obvious that it's coming from the same wallet as the input, then that's obviously the change. Right? So it's one way in which chain analysis is made a lot easier is, is if they can track through, well that's the same wallet going through all those outputs. Uh, yeah, so that would be yeah, something else. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Uh, all right, thanks. <laughs>